for I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace in me hath not been void. Words taken from today's epistle, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Just how much does St. Paul merit the title of teacher of all the nations? It might well be said that every argument against Christianity, indeed the whole of anti-Christian thought and culture, is nothing more than 2,000 years of ignoring the existence of St. Paul. To be sure, the arguments against the Gospels are quite feeble, but they seem to afford many men with enough intellectual security to remain on the sidelines of the way of the cross. The man Christ Jesus portrayed in the Gospels is no doubt a compelling figure, the skeptics say, but who knows how accurate those accounts are. These are the exuberant words of, at best, well-meaning disciples seeking to extol their master and elevate him far beyond the persons of true history to vie with the great legends and myths of ancient times. Most men, content with this argument, then seek no further. That is because they have chosen to ignore St. Paul. In all history, St. Paul has never had a more eloquent admirer than the fourth century bishop and doctor, St. John Chrysostom. He tells us, as I listen intently to the reading of St. Paul's epistles, often two or three times a week, whenever we commemorate the holy martyrs, I am filled with joy, delighting in the sound of that spiritual trumpet. And as I recognize the voice of a friend, I am roused and enkindled with love, so that I almost seem to see him present and to hear him speaking. But nevertheless, I am grieved and am troubled that all do not know this great man as he deserves to be known. Indeed, many are so ignorant that they do not even know how many epistles he wrote. But this ignorance is not due to a want of intelligence on their part, but because they will not carefully study the writings of this great man. Do you refuse to listen to the friends of Christ? Well, then grant an audience to this dear friend of ours, who was once Christ's enemy. In his epistle to the Philippians, Paul affords us the briefest yet most moving of autobiographies. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ. Saul of Tarsus was a devoted enemy of the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. He was a member of that powerful faction in Jerusalem known as the Pharisees. He advocated strict adherence to the law of Moses and merciless persecution of this new fledgling group that dared to proclaim a new way open to all peoples. Having overseen the brutal execution of their eloquent preacher Stephen, Saul then eagerly volunteered to arrest 
other followers and then bring this new religion to an end. Yet in a moment, as he made his way to Damascus to accomplish this mission, something changed. He was thrown from his beast and made blind. A voice from heaven declared to him that the people he was persecuting was no, were none other than the Messiah himself, who Christ and his church are always one. Saul arrived at Damascus and was restored to sight by the Christian Ananias. Being baptized, he gave himself at once with all zeal to his mission, a new mission from God, to proclaim the truth of the gospel to the ends of the earth. The fathers of the church are in accord in finding in this Saul of Tarsus the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken of old by Jacob. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, in the morning devouring the prey, but in the evening dividing the spoil. This son of the tribe of Benjamin, named for Israel's tragic first king, was a ravenous wolf indeed. In the morning of his life, he pursued Christ with a boundless ferocity in order to destroy his very name from the earth. Having found him, he counted this spoil as greater than any treasure the world could ever hope to offer. And he then spent the evening of his earthly existence sharing that divine spoil with all the nations he could reach by his travels and toils. The first Saul fought against David and perished by the sad sword of suicide atop Mount Geboa, outside of the future royal capital of Jerusalem. The second Saul, now Romanized as Paul, so that he might be all things to all men and gain all men for Christ, the son of David, poured out every ounce of his life for the sake of the gospel until he suffered martyrdom by the sword outside the walls of the future capital of the kingdom of the new and eternal testament. Why do we praise St. Paul today? Today is no great feast of the apostle, but it is never out of place to speak of him. We are in the midst of Trinity time, the long series of Sundays after Pentecost. On nearly all of these Sundays, we read from the epistles of St. Paul. On this 11th Sunday after Pentecost, the Church places us amongst those first believers of the Church founded by St. Paul in the pagan Greek city of Corinth. In this first epistle, to the church at Corinth, Paul rebukes his flock for having so quickly abandoned the truth which he had preached to them and returned to the most shameful practices of the pagan world around them and broken into factions. Some responded well to this stern correction, but many others decided they would be better off with new teachers who offered them an easier path. After all, the seduction ran, who was this Paul anyway? How could he of all people dare to rebuke us for our sins? He is the greatest sinner of all, a persecutor of Christ's church. This he cannot deny. Indeed, he has always been the first to tell us of it. He has frankly admitted I have no letter of recommendation except you yourselves. Yes, he says, you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. I am your father, 
for I begot you all in the gospel. It hurts for a father to be betrayed by his children, but in the end I don't care if you hate me, if only for rebuking you, as long as you learn to hate sin and turn back to God. On this Sunday, when the gospel recalls to us the ceremonies of baptism, St. Paul reminds us of the creed we professed on the day of our baptism, in which we must never cease professing to the day of our death. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This is the gospel we have received, wherein we stand by which we are saved, unless we have believed in vain. Let us then hold fast to the preaching of the Apostle of the Gentiles, that we may be saved on the day of judgment. For we can all say with St. Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let not his grace in me be void. Amen. <clears throat>